Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering pediatric hypoxemia. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and to support this channel. How can you do that? Like this video. You're going to love it. Just press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, guys, so let's get started right here. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Okay, so hypoxemia. Hypoxemia, guys, this is decreased oxygen where? In the blood. You see that E-M-I-A, emia, that's in the blood. So hypoxemia is decreased oxygen in the blood. Hypoxia is decreased oxygen where? In the tissues. But here's the thing. If we have decreased oxygen in the bloodstream, there's, there, there's going to be decreased oxygen to the tissues because it's the blood, it's the oxygen that's in the bloodstream that goes to the tissues to perfuse the tissues, right? So hypoxemia, this refers to arterial oxygen tension that is lower than normal and can be identified by decreased arterial saturation or decreased partial pressure of oxygen. That leads me to another point. You guys tend to confuse the O2 sat and the partial pressure of oxygen. So let's clear this up, guys. The O2 sat, you want to be between 98 and 100. Now, we'll accept 95 or higher, but great case scenario, 98 to 100, but 95 or higher is acceptable. Partial pressure of oxygen, this is PaO2. So when I was talking to you about the O2 sat, that's SaO2. The SaO2, we want 98 to 100, but we're willing to accept 95 to 100. That's your SaO2, okay? Okay, that's your oxygen saturation. Now this, your PaO2, that is your partial pressure of oxygen. And normal for that is 80 to 100, right? So you, if you see a partial pressure of 88, that's okay. Partial pressure oxygen, PaO2, we want 80 to 100. SaO2, which is your oxygen saturation rate, that we want 95 to 100, preferably 98 to 100. Okay, so let's keep going. Now, hypoxia, remember I told you hypoxemia, that was decreased oxygen to tissue, uh, excuse me, decreased oxygen in the bloodstream. Hypoxia is reduction of tissue oxygenation. What is cyanosis? That's that bluish, dis bluish discoloration when the patient's not getting enough oxygen. Cyanosis, it's a blue, blue discoloration in the mucous membranes, the skin, the nail breads of the child with reduced oxygen saturation. So that SAO2 being low, remember SA2, 95 to 100, SA2 being low, that can cause that patient to have the bluish color where if you look inside the uh, oral mucous membranes, you can see that coloration is blue, or you look at their skin, you see them turning a bluish colors, or you look at their nails and you see that nail blue instead of being pink. That pink color, by the way, that you see is um, blood flow. What's being carried in the blood? Oxygen. Remember, oxygen is riding on hemoglobin that's in the RBC that's carried where? In the blood, okay? So now let's go over the clinical manifestations. Over time, two physiological changes occur in the body in response to chronic hypoxemia. So if this patient's been subject to decreased oxygen in the bloodstream for a prolonged amount of time, and we know it's prolonged because it said chronic, right? It didn't say acute, it said chronic. Two things happen. What are those two things that we see happen? Polycythemia and clubbing. When you guys don't know a word, please, I beg you as nursing students, don't just skip over it hoping that you don't see it on a test because that one word that you skip over, that's what you're going to see on a test. And that's what's going to make or break you to get that answer correct. Look it up. Polycythemia, poly, a lot of, psi, cells, emia, blood and clubbing. So let's look at polycythemia. Polycythemia, this is an increased, a lot of what? red blood cells. Why would a patient have polycythemia if they have chronic hypoxemia? Well, think about it. Your body is meant to survive no matter what. So when you're in that chronic state of not having enough oxygen in your bloodstream, your body says, whoa, you know what? We're about to die. We're about to go down. We got to do something. So then it makes your... um. 
what's in your bone, your bone marrow, because remember, those are where your blood cells are being formed in your bone marrow. Your bone marrow starts producing more red blood cells. Okay, Professor D, but why red blood cells? Remember, I just told you what's inside of the red blood cells, hemoglobin. What does hemoglobin carry? Oxygen. That's why you're going to see polycythemia. And what's the other thing we're going to see? Clubbing. Let's talk about clubbing. Clubbing, this is a thickening and flattening of the tips of the fingers and toes. And it's thought to occur because of chronic tissue hypoxemia and polycythemia. So we believe that's what causes the clubbing. Well, we're not 100% sure, but we can tell you for sure those are the two things you're going to see in the patient that has chronic hypoxemia, polycythemia, the increased number in the RBCs, and clubbing. Hypercyanotic spells, also known as blue spells or TET spells, and guys, you have to know the name of all three because for testing purpose, they'll change them. They'll alternate them, okay? You have to know the name of all three. So hypercyanotic spells, blue spells, tet, spell, um, tet, tet spells, because they're often seen in infants with tetralogy of phthalate, may occur in any child whose heart defect includes obstruction to pulmonary blood flow and communication between the ventricles. And that makes sense because that leads to what? Decreased oxygen. Now, guys, I encourage you, if you haven't already watched my videos on the different um, um, congenital cardiac um, abnormalities, go back and watch it because this will make a lot more sense to you when you do. Make sure you go and watch those videos. All right, spells, spells rarely seen before two months of age occur most frequently in the first year of life. They occur more often in the morning and can be preceded by, look at this, feeding, crying, defecation, or stressful procedures. What do all of these things have in common, guys? Feeding, crying, defecation, stressful procedures. It takes up more oxygen. Oxygen that the patient already, excuse me, already doesn't have. So that's why we'll tend to see those clinical manifestations. It makes sense because profound hypoxemia causes cerebral hypoxia. That means decreased oxygen to the brain. Hypercyanotic spells require prompt assessment and treatment to prevent brain damage or possibly death. Because guess what? Once those brain cells die, that is it. They do not regenerate. Diagnostic evaluation. A hyperoxia test is helpful. And <laughs> I wrote up here, I put a star next to it. Make sure you guys know that test the hyperoxia test, the infants placed in the 100% oxygen environment and blood parameters are monitored. The partial pressure of oxygen of 100 millimeter, uh, MMHG or higher suggests lung disease and um, uh, partial pressure of oxygen lower than 100 suggests cardiac disease. So the name of this test of what they do is the hyperoxia test. And make sure you know the difference between these two. Therapeutic management. This is your key, prostaglandin. Prostaglandin, which causes a vasodilation. We love vasodilation because vasodilation increases blood flow, which increases oxygen supply, right? Prostaglandin, which causes vasodilation, smooth muscle relaxation, thus increasing dilation and patency of the ductus arteriosus. It's administered IV to reestablish pulmonary blood flow. And that's very important because guess what that's going to bring? More oxygen. The use of prostaglandins have been life-saving in infants with ductus-dependent cardiac defects. The increase in oxygenation allows the infant to be stabilized. Okay, so make sure you know about prostaglandin. What else? Morphine. Morphine is administered subcutaneously or through an existing IV line, and it helps uh, reduce infundibular spasm. Treating hypercyanotic, aka blue, aka tet spells. Make sure you know the name of all of them. Treating it. You're going to place the infant in knee chest position. You see, I put a star in NCLEX next to it. Make sure you know it. You're going to place the patient in knee chest position. Use a calm, soothing, comforting voice and approach because the more that they cry and the more that they fuss, the more their oxygen demand is, oxygen that they don't have, right? So we want to try to be as calm as possible so that they calm down. 
You're going to administer 100% blow by oxygen. You're going to give them morphine. Again, how's that morphine given? Either subcutaneously or through an IV line that's already been established. You're going to begin IV fluid replacement and volume expansion if needed and repeat the morphine administration. That's how you treat those spells. Other treatment measures, you want to make sure that that patient stays hydrated. We want to avoid dehydration. Aggressive pulmonary hygiene, chest physical therapy, administration of antibiotics, and use of oxygen therapy. All of these will help that patient to breathe better and bring more oxygen to the tissues. Nursing care management. Blue lips and fingernails are obvious signs of their hidden cardiac defect. Clubbing and small, thin stature in older children for further indicate severe heart disease. So you have to be watching out for those signs and symptoms in the patient. Dehydration has to be prevented. That's why we're going to be giving them fluids. We're going to make sure that they're hydrated. Fluid status is carefully monitored. We're going to be doing the INOs. We're going to be the, doing daily weights on them because remember, the best way to measure that patient's um, fluid status of how much fluid they're actually holding on to is what? It's not INO, it's not skin turgor, it's daily weights. You're gonna do daily weights in the morning using the same scale, using the same type of clothing, okay? Fluid should be readily available and gavage feeding or IV hydration is given to children unable to take adequate oral fluids. Again, we have to prevent dehydration. We wanna make sure we keep that patient hydrated, give them lots of fluids. We're gonna do good hand hygiene, protect them from people who are sick that have respiratory tract infections, aggressive pulmonary hygiene, treating with antibiotics or antivirals. We're going to give them oxygen. We're going to do chest percussion. Anything that we can do to keep that patient, um, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Keeping, keep, to keep that patient adequately perfused, right? Right. That's what I'm looking for. So nursing alert. Take a look at this. Therefore, oh, let me scroll down. Therefore, all IV lines should have filters in place to prevent air from entering the system. The entire tubing should be checked for air. All connections should be taped securely and any air should be removed. Guys, we don't want to be the one to give the patient air embolism. We absolutely don't. And I think that's the end of this chapter, but I'm not sure. Sure is. So um, that is the end, guys for um, hypoxemia in the pediatric patient. As always, I'm gonna ask you to please let me know in the comment section what you thought about this video, what you'd like to see me cover or cover more extensively. Don't forget every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, I have a video that is released where I cover an uh, questions. I teach you how to answer the questions. I teach you how to eliminate the wrong answer choices. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys catch me on the next video.